Hey, everybody, it's the Drive to School podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, your host. My friend David Zills is back. How's it going? I am doing really well. How are you doing, Harrison? I'm doing well, too. Thanks for asking. Um, We've been talking about... uh, some of the myths that you sort of encounter as you as you wrestle with deconstruction, um, and maybe just for thirty seconds, if this is the first one in there, what what is deconstruction, and why is everybody talking about it in the church? And then we'll dive into the myth today. Yeah, so deconstruction is really when you take. I like the. It's a good word. It describes it's a good mental picture where you have kind of a belief system, a way of seeing life that has worked for you and then something happens and it doesn't work for you anymore and you have to tear part of it down. And I think the question is, I think that's that's appropriate and we all have to do that from time to time. The question is, what do you replace it with? Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, there's the reconstruction bit. And I think that's um, just as important to talk about. But deconstruction often refers to people who are leaving the faith. They're saying, you know, this Christianity, <coughs> belief I grew up with worked for me. Now it doesn't. I'm, and maybe they, maybe they replace it with a different kind of faith. Maybe they're Southern Baptist and they're like, you know, that's really legalistic and really kind of modern and American. And there's just a lot of like weird subculture stuff, but Anglican has a lot of rich history going back through the ages and they're tapped into the tradition and Christians from other times that didn't have our biases. And so, you know, that it might be look like that, or it might be someone who says, you know, Christianity is just very oppressive and I, I need to be done with it because like, that's not loving. It's, it's, it's just bad. And Christians are, are really just biased and bigots and I need to be open-minded. And, you know, so it can look like a lot of things, but what it has in common is you have a belief system that works for you as a, a, a you know, usually as a young person. And then you say, you know, it's not working anymore. Um, and so it's a new word for an age old thing. So deconstruction, you can find it all over Twitter. Um, mm-hmm. actually, because I've been doing these, um, podcasts now, YouTube is recommending to me, um, mm-hmm. interviews with people who have deconstructed. So it's all over the place. And it, uh, unfortunately it's very emotionally charged. And some of this is understandable, but I think there are a lot of reactions, especially Christian reactions that are just not helpful, not full of the grace that Jesus would show. Um, mm-hmm. I know I deconstructed in my own way, um, back in the the 2000s and 2010s. And, um, and then I came out with a much richer, stronger faith because I kind of dig down to the bottom and said, what's really the foundation that I can stand on? And I think that's what deconstruction is when it's healthy, but, you know, we got to show grace because, um, otherwise we're just (laughs) feeding into these myths that Christianities are bigots and biased and, and not loving and all these things. And, and so I think that's what I'm trying to capture in this series is how do you show grace to someone who's deconstructing? How, well, what would be Jesus heart in this? And sometimes you need to say, you know, let's, let's look at truth and not throw the baby out with the bath water. Maybe there are unhelpful parts of Christianity we should get rid of, but don't throw the whole thing out. But I think a lot of times just your heart posture toward it can make the biggest difference. Absolutely. And and I, I like that when we talk about don't throw the whole thing out, we're not throwing out the word. We're not throwing out the truth. We're not throwing out the gospel. But there are things that get attached to it because there is such a thing as a devil. And the devil loves to attach anchors to the ship to try and sink it. The, the devil loves to, to attach falsehoods to the truth to try and make you throw the whole thing out. And in, in a way, this can be a place to, to actually chase down the purity of the religion instead of uh, the trappings that may or may not have gotten attached to it along the way for various reasons. Um, so yeah, you know, I think the devil does his fair share, but so do people. Like 100%. People, people, people are fallible, and we we like to add add stuff, and and you know we like to conform our worldview to our comfort zone, and sometimes that's part of the problem too. So yeah, there's plenty of reasons why things can get why things can get distorted. Absolutely. So uh, we kind of I, I think hinted at today's myth a couple times just in the 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 prologue, but uh, what are we tackling today? Yeah. So um, in the last two episodes, we looked at uh, the first one, two episodes ago was, um, shoot, I'm drawing a blank. What was that one? Oh, was Christianity is just fire insurance. You know, the point of religion is to get your sins forgiven. So you get to heaven and that's it. And that, that, that creates so many problems, spiritual, intellectual. It's just, so we, we, we deconstructed that one a little bit. And then last time we talked about Christianity is about, is about religious hate. 
you know, maybe God hates certain people, certainly Christians do at times, or they at least can be perceived that way. Um, so how, how do we navigate, um, you know, recapturing God's love for everyone, um, which is really what you see in the ministry of Jesus. And this time I want to talk about something that's related to those two, which is the idea that Christianity is too restrictive and exclusive. So it's like it's a straitjacket. It tells you, hey, believe these things, do these things, anything else is, you know, Verboten, as the Germans would say, you know, you can't go there. Um, and so it's like the straitjacket that's supposed to box you in. And, you know, modern people don't like to be boxed in. We like to be able to do whatever makes us feel good. Um, whatever, you know, we like to be able to find the life that's most life giving to us and not have to be confined. And so there's this idea that Christianity is too restrictive and exclusive, like a straitjacket. Sure. And this is sort of one of those, especially inside of American Christianity, where freedom is is just in the water. Um, how, how do we talk about this? Because Jesus talks about freedom, too. Um, and so most of the time when when sort of Christianity is as being restrictive is thrown in your face. Um, I, I think we have to be honest that that the first thing we're talking about is that you have a moral code that other people don't have. Right. Um. Yeah, so that that's definitely part of it. And so um, anytime you're going to say there is such a thing as morality, um, you know, that that's restrictive. Um, and most people actually don't disagree that there is such a thing as morality. Like most people would say um, really extreme things like rape for no reason, torturing babies for fun, pedophilia. You know, there are a lot of genocide. There are a lot of these things where people will say, those are moral wrong. codes are good. Let's actually have a moral code against that stuff. But then there are these edge cases where people disagree about the content of the moral code, like especially sexual ethics. And I think we'll have to hit that at some point in this episode. Sure. Like people will say, I should do whatever I want as long as it's consensual and it's not hurting anyone versus, you know, maybe there's something else to what a good sexuality looks like. Um, and so, um, and so I think there's, you know, there's, when we talk about morality and especially is Christian and restrictive, there's, there's the content of the morality and then there's the heart behind the morality. And I think one thing that's important to acknowledge is that both of these do get distorted in American Christianity and in Christianity through the ages, there is such a thing as legalism that is spiritually toxic. And, um, you know, I, I hope it's not something we see so much. We're talking, um, you know, a lot about, the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, I, I would hope it's not as much a thing there, although it can be in some ways. Um, but you see it more in your face in other forms of American Christianity. You see it in the news. Um, you know, there's there's all sorts of stuff where people say, you know, the content, they add content to the morality. So God has said you're free in this area. And they say, well, actually, you know, gender roles, you know, femininity is this very narrow thing. If you don't conform to that, you're not a valid woman and you're not pleasing God as a woman. Same with masculinity. Masculinity is this very narrow thing. And if you don't do that, then, um, you know, and so, or it could be around um, entertainment or it could be, you know, dancing cards, things like that. It could be around um, all sorts of things. It could be around dress, how you dress, um, particularly as a female. It could be so many things where people say, it's kind of like the Pharisees, you, you know, the Jewish sect that Jesus butt heads with a lot, um, where they said, um, you know, there are these laws God has given, and we really don't want to mess those up. And so we're going to add these helper laws around it as like a as like a barrier to help us not get anywhere close. And so, you know, lust is bad. So therefore, let's have extreme modesty, which actually lust, the primary responsibility is on the man, not the woman. When Jesus talks mm -hmm. about it, he talks to the man, to the men and says, tear your eye out if you lust. He doesn't talk to the women and say, dress modestly. I think, you know, there's room for both, but there's so many extreme versions of these things where people say you shall not even get close to anything that is bad. And then it, they add content to the morality that's not there in scripture. And then it becomes this, this thing that is restrictive and more restrictive than God wants. And I think it's important to acknowledge that there are forms of religion and Christianity in particular that are too restrictive. And so in some ways, this could be a valid critique. And that's where it's important to be discerning. And when someone says thou shalt or thou shalt not look and say, is that is that really the way it is? 
Yeah, and from there, you, you actually get to, to sort of pair back into the, the places where you can say there, there there are helpful things inside of this, but let's not make them legal things in this. And that's actually what Paul does. He says all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. And that means that we don't need a strict legal code for everything. And when you find somebody trying to make a legal code out of everything that might help somebody, pretty soon you're going to actually find out that you're you're crushing the spirit of it in, inside of it because the law is about love for neighbor and not avoidance of, of hurt. I think that's really important. And I, and I guess that's the second thing. We talked about the content of the law and how people like to add to it. There's also the spirit of morality. And is it about shame and fear? And I see that a lot in a lot of American Christian circles where there's shame and fear. And that is totally at odds with what you see people teaching Jesus and Paul and the other followers of Jesus in the New Testament. You know, there's this passage in First John that says, Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. There is no fear in love because fear has to do with punishment. And we know that in Jesus, the punishment is taken away. There is no condemnation. You know, that's the shame bit. Paul writes, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, we are, um, we are fully approved, fully acceptable in God's sight. And and our freedom is to love God and love other people. And so when you feel things beating down on you and crushing your spirit, that's that's not of God. And it just might be appropriate to question and deconstruct that a little bit. A hundred percent. Where else can we go with this? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, I think we need to talk a little bit about truth. Um, and, and I think when, you know, when I was growing up, truth was something people wanted. They wanted to know what was true. When I was in college, people were like, is science going to give us truth? What is that truth? You know, is skepticism going to get rid of all the stuff that's not true so that whatever's left is true? And that was really big, you know, when I was in college in the 2000s. Um, but these days, truth is kind of seen as this oppressive thing. Like it tells you who to be and what not to do. And it gets in the way of your freedom. And I think it's important to look at truth a little bit and maybe deconstruct this oppressive view of truth, because I don't think that's really the way it is, certainly not um, in the Bible. Um, and I think we can look at it through two lenses. We can talk about true ideas and true people, and particular hmm. um, trustworthiness of people, and in particular, the trustworthiness of God. So true ideas, um, might, sounds a little abstract, but I think really the key is, is What's real? What is reality? Are we accurately describing reality? Because the fact of the matter is we're not completely free in reality. There are physical laws that constrain us. So if you jump off a cliff, you're going to fall. You can't just fly. Like there are physical laws. And if you try to live outside of those physical laws, you're going to get hurt. There are similarly spiritual laws. Maybe modern people don't like to call them spiritual. Maybe they'd rather call them psychological or something or emotional. But, you know, if you constantly neglect relationships with people who who are close to you, those relationships are going to suffer. And soon you're going to look at the person and be like, I don't know you like I once did. Um, you know, if you um, are not reliable, people aren't going to trust you. There are spiritual laws. Um, and so the question I would say is, is Christianity too restrictive? I would say, is Christianity an accurate description of reality, an accurate description of the spiritual laws that constrain just human nature? And if it's the case, now that we talked about how to think about that in previous episodes last year when we were doing apologetics, but if it's the case that Jesus really is God and his teachings reflect a God's eye view of reality that we couldn't know on our own, then... Um, then that means that when we follow Jesus' teachings, we're really living in harmony with reality, which is really the best way to live. So this is why Jesus said, if you follow my teachings, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. He didn't say truth will be a straitjacket. He said it will set you free. It's because we're living in harmony with the way things really are. Right. And this happens both according to the law and according to the gospel. Um, so to, to live in, in harmony with reality, according to the law, actually means you're going to get hurt less because sin breaks stuff. So if you want to talk about sort of long term freedom, I can tell you, please don't jump off a cliff. And you can be like, whatever, man, I do what I want. You don't be so restrictive. But if you jump off the cliff, like you're going to be more restricted after you hit the ground than had you had you not jumped because of the hospital and whatnot. Um, and, and in the same way, also, according to the gospel, um, there, there is a great freedom to be uh, a 
apart from guilt and shame because of the power of the gospel. That, that the, the freedom that Jesus promises is that your conscience is no longer a, a straitjacket either because sin breaks stuff and, and all of us fall into sin. All of us fall uh, uh, outside of God's pr- uh, words and commands. And because of that, we suffer. But he also no longer says, I will only meet that with punishment and, and ostracization. Uh, but but rather, he says, I forgive you your sins. And so you can actually look at yourself as if that you are worthy of love because Christ has has loved you. Um, to, to simply recognize then Christianity as, as a, a, a truth uh, then that that accurately describes reality. It not only lets you sort of try to navigate this apart from external pain, but even uh, apart from the internal strife that that comes from living out of step with uh, what you know to be good and true and beautiful. I think that I think that's really powerful, and that gets at the second point, which is we talked about true ideas living in harmony with reality, but there's also true people, um, people you can depend on, people you can count on, people who live up to their word. Um, and I think um, there's this idea, you know, the German word that we get the word true from is Troy, which really means faithful or dependable or trustworthy. Um, and when you look at the character of God in the Bible, it's the ultimate thing you can depend on. In fact, if you if you try, I saw this quote, um, it might have been Tim Keller. I know I quote him a lot, but I just think he has a lot of insight. And he said, if you put your ultimate confidence in anything less than God, you, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. So if you say, you know, the, the, the deepest desires of my soul for meaning, for value, for significance, for um, a good future, if you put that in your career or in your spouse or in your own likability or, um, or in your education or, um, or in your friends or in your family, all these things will let us down, you know, and at some point we all die. So all these things go away. So if you put um, your ultimate confidence in less than ultimate things, you're setting yourself up to be disappointed in really big ways because the bigger your hopes are, the bigger the disappointment when they aren't, when they aren't satisfied. So if you put your trust in God, is God someone you can depend on? And I think the answer, when you look at scripture, when you look at if, if God really is, if Jesus is exactly like God and Jesus is really God, and if he is willing to be traumatized, you know, we talk about the suffering of Jesus, the suffering of God, the tears of God, but the cross, maybe a more compelling way to say it is the cross is the trauma of God. If God is willing to do that because he loves us so much, and if he is able to defeat that and change the meaning of that trauma in the resurrection, then he's able to do that with our trauma. He, There's nothing that he can't handle. Um, and so if God is that for us that much, you know, Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, he gave up his most costly thing. You know, he was willing to pay the most precious thing he had in order to, to take care of us. You know, that's something you can depend on. So, you know, rather than truth, you know, being a straitjacket, I think a better metaphor is truth is a foundation. Uh, or truth is bedrock. It's something that when you hit rock bottom, it's not something you conjured up on your own that you have to figure out to make it work. It's something Mm -hmm. outside of you that can take hold of you and say, I've got you. It's going to be okay. And so I think there's this dependability aspect of truth and in particular, the character of God who is for us. That's very important in all this. See, and this is one of those those last great freedom points too. Is if truth is outside of yourself, uh, it, it seems really restrictive because you're not in control of it. And so every once in a while, it's going to tell you a thing you don't like. But if if truth is inside of yourself, even though you call it truth, you can never trust it because you've been wrong before. That yeah. your truth has 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 led you astray before. If if a truth is outside of yourself, it's at least dependable as as long as it's from, like you said, a dependable source. Uh, and here we have the God who is willing to bleed and die for us. And so, a truth that you can trust in is actually a lot more free than a truth that you can't trust. Yeah, I think that's well said. Um, yeah. So maybe one last point um, before we wrap up. I think something that's probably in the back of everyone's mind these days when we say Christianity is too restrictive is sexual ethics. Because that is where a, that, that's where a lot of people see Christianity says, you should only do this very specific thing and anything else is really bad. Um, and so I think it's important to address that just because that is a common issue and we can't exhaust it. Like this is a big issue. It, there have been books written on this. But I think at, at a very high level, what we, what we can say is there are 
two there are two sides to this that I think are both wrong. You know, one is purity culture, and I, I'm borrowing mm-hmm. from Tim Allman, a pastor uh, at a at a LCMS church in Arizona, and he said this in a sermon once, and I thought it just really made a lot of sense. And he said, one on one side you have purity culture. This was big when I was growing up as a millennial in the 90s and 2000s. You know, I kind of joke with my for my Christian friends that growing up in the 2000s, Christian youth group only cared about two things. Don't have sex before marriage and don't believe in evolution. You know, maybe yeah. our parents were still reeling from the 60s and 70s. I don't know. But it was, it was pretty, pretty specific. But purity culture says, you know, yeah, sex is great when you're married, but there are all of these bad things around that. So like, just don't have sex before you're married. Don't, don't be gay. Don't do all these things. Like, don't, 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 don't. And if you do... Oh boy, we're going to try to forgive you, but you kind of have a scarlet letter. And I don't think that's correct. On the other extreme, you have our culture, which says anything goes as long as it's consensual and not hurting anybody. And, you know, even if it hurts a little, as long as it's consensual and you, you like it to some degree, you know, that's okay. And so I think the way of Jesus is somewhere that will critique both of these, but has aspects in common with both of these. It would have things in common with purity culture that says, yeah, there is, there are, there are, a, there are good ways to navigate sexuality and there are bad ways, but it's going to critique the, um, the guilt and the shame and the emphasis on don't, don't, don't. And then there are aspects in common with the culture that say sex is supposed to be life giving and a really positive thing, but it's going to critique, Jesus is going to critique that anything is life giving, that anything is good as long as you consent. Um, and I, so, so I think the way that um, I've heard this described that was helpful for me is, you know, Jesus' sexual ethic, we talk about what are Christians against versus what are they for in the previous episode. And I think too often with sexual ethics, people hear about what Christians are against and they feel like, ah, Christianity is a straitjacket. But I think, you know, when you look at the Christian description of what sexuality is, we can actually say, what are we for? And the culture would say sexuality is just a physical act, perhaps, or that, you know, that they could define it, all these things. But I think Christianity actually has the highest view of sexuality. It doesn't say it's this dirty thing. It says it's this very precious thing. It's this way to be intimate within the context of total commitment and security, the security of a commitment where you know this person's not going to abandon you, and to be intimate in a way and experience the joy of intimacy in a way that reflects really what reality is all about. God is Trinity. He's three persons living in loving relationships with each other. He shows that love to us. And we get a picture of that in, in a special way in sexuality. And so sexuality, the, the guardrails we put on sexuality are not because it's a dirty thing, but because it's an infinite it's a precious powerful thing. thing. It's a, well, and it's and a it's powerful, powerful thing. Yeah, it, it, it taps into our deep emotions in ways that very few things can. Why is sexual trauma often so worse than other forms of trauma? Why is sexual abuse so? It's because it's connected to our soul in ways that other things aren't. And so um, that's what we are for. And then when we mess up, like we are all sexually broken, whether it's pornography, whether it's, um, you know, homosexuality, like you can be sexually broken and be heterosexual. Like just because you're not gay doesn't mean you're not broken. Like we're all sexually broken. We all struggle in this area. There's distortions because of the fall that we have to wrestle with. And like you said, when we live in the gospel, the truth of the gospel, we're set free from the condemnation of, oh, I got to beat myself up every time I fail. Rather, we're forgiven and we say, hey, this is the thing we're striving for. The vision of sexuality is a good thing created by God. You know, pick yourself up. Jesus is with you. Let's move on. You're forgiven. You know, let's pursue the good things God has for us. Absolutely. Thank you very much for starting to, to unravel a, a very complex web. Yeah, I don't think we can do justice to this, um, but um, hopefully we at least hit some highlights in ways that maybe are helpful. Well, and, and and let's treat this as what it is. This is not the entirety of the conversation. This is the beginnings of a conversation. Carry it forward with your parents, with your pastor, uh, with, with your trusted people who who God has given you to to sort of work through these things. Yeah, no, that that's important. Our our short little 20, 30 minute podcasts on this are not exhaustive. They are just starting a conversation. So if something, if we say something and you feel like that doesn't satisfy me, honestly, that's to be expected. 
um, you know, that there's more to, to unpack these things and that's okay. And there are resources for that. Absolutely. David, thanks so much.